Ohio's Uncertain Coal Future. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News, Andy Chow, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Bob Clegg, Republican strategist, and Joseph Moss of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. For decades, Eastern Ohio has relied on coal to provide jobs and a decent living for miners. The past eight years have been tough on the coal industry. Lots of job losses, the reasons, competition from cheaper and more plentiful natural gas, more and more automation, and tougher environmental regulations issued by former President Obama. This week, the new president rolled back many of those environmental regulations designed to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and ease climate change. Donald Trump promised lifting those regulations alone would restore jobs to coal country. Perhaps no single regulation threatens our miners, energy workers, and companies more than this crushing attack on American industry. My administration is putting an end to the war on coal. Going to have clean coal, really clean coal. Andy Chow, is the war on coal over? Do these end of these regulations end the war? What do the experts say? I guess it depends on what your definition of a war on coal is. I mean, there were regulations coming from the Obama administration to cut down on carbon emissions, something that leaders from around the world have agreed to, saying that that's important. Coal isn't dying in Ohio because of regulations. It's dying because it's just an expensive resource. You have natural gas that's a lot cheaper. You have more and more companies who want to invest in energy efficiency because they see the value in it. And then you have solar, wind projects coming in. Coal is just not as cheap as it used to be. And so it's not competing in the marketplace. It, you have these old factories that just aren't as efficient as they used to be. And that, along with automation, is the reason coal is not doing well in Ohio. The energy markets move in cycles. You have booms and busts. That's just the nature of it. Is this just a, a low point for coal, and can it ever come back? Like, can natural gas go down and coal come back? Well, I would note that I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think that still the, the, the base load of power generated in Ohio is predominantly coal. I think a few years ago it was like at 85 or 95 percent. So it's, it's, a, it's a still a big deal. Yeah. Um, but uh, it has had a, it's been several years of decline in coal and then a much, uh, a bigger rise for natural gas powered plants. Production in coal actually increased from 1933 all the way to 2008 in a pretty steady climb. But the employment, that is the number of coal miners that you, you needed, actually has not gone up at the same rate. But another phenomenon took place at that time uh, between actually 2000 and the president in 2017 and that is that China has quadrupled its coal production so that uh, all the exports in coal that we were doing uh, out of the west coast have basically evaporated. So Bob can we just move on from coal because should Ohio move on from coal because the trend is even though we still have a lot of plants using yeah. coal the trend is definitely moving to natural gas, sure. at least in the near future. Well, and I think what we have to do is what the president talked about is have everything on the table with regards to energy, including coal, because like you said, right now natural gas is much cheaper than coal, but that could change. And I think with the coal industry, not having those tough regulations will help them in like manning up and getting production going if it becomes more affordable and a cheaper option. So I think we have to have all the alternatives, whether it's solar, wind, you know, natural gas, coal, everything to make us energy and independent. Well, and you, you talk to some power companies in Ohio who say that they, they would like some sort of help, some sort of boost uh, to be able to charge customers on their electric bill to get some sort of a bailout. And they don't say that it's just these uh, egregious regulations on coal that's hurting them. It's just these plants are older, they're less efficient, they need to clean them up because they, they want to make them more efficient. Yeah, and on that topic, I think that what management, what coal management anticipates is that the turnover from the old plants that Andy talked about to the newer gas-operated plants or perhaps nuclear or something else will probably slow down uh, over the next four years or however long uh, we might be looking at this thing. But management does not anticipate that in the short term, increase in employment in the mines 
will be beyond 10 percent. That, that was stunning. The dispatch had a nice story last week in the, on Sunday, and they, they pointed out that there are more florists, Laura, in, <laughs> in Ohio than there are coal miners. And that doesn't count the coal miners from Ohio who go to work in mines in West Virginia and, and Pennsylvania, but still. That, uh, it, but the coal miners get a lot of attention from politicians and at the state house and in, during campaigns, but there are more florists than coal miners. As nice as flowers are, <laughs> yeah. they're not essential to operating your business, living in your house, uh, watching this on TV right now. Yeah. You can thank a coal miner because this is what's powering the electricity running through the, the wires to, to get so it, it to you. It's more than just the romanticism, the coal mine, and the image of a working person trying to feed his family. It's, 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 it's essential it's, to it's the an economy. Essential economy. Right. Yeah. And, you, and you don't have towns, you don't walk into a town and say, I got to warn you, this is a flower town. <laughs> you say, this is a coal town. The coal, coal mining and coal people who are coal miners are, are very much connected into the community and it's where they find their identity in a lot of these places. Also, um, over the years, the, the, the Mine Workers Union have, has done a very good job of representing miners and being in the political process. And I think having that presence for all these years, you know, we're talking 70, 80, 100 years, uh, has helped miners have a higher profile than florists or other, yeah. other type of workers. We're gonna get all kinds of notes from florists, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure of it. But Andy, is there, but is there, is the end in sight for coal? You just think that this, unless they can come up with truly clean coal and a way to burn it cleanly, that eventually innovation is going to be on the solar, on the wind side, and then natural gas. I don't know if we're ever going to see a complete end to it. When you look at some of the plans that AEP and First Energy have put out there, they've, they've suggested that they'll keep running the, the plants that now exist, so the, the power generators that now exist, till 2030, 2035. So, and I think people are still going to mine as well. So I think you're still going to see some sort of production there, but not nearly as much as we've seen in the past. The energy mandates, the House has, the Ohio House has voted to scrap the mandates, make it more, make it voluntary. Um, does that help coal, Bob? Yeah, I think it will. Um, I think anything that won't force industries to abandon coal, like the federal regs had been doing and, and what the state's doing, I think is going to only help coal. These are the mandates that we require a certain percentage yeah, be alternative or renewables. Yeah. But that hurts, they, critics of these, of the move say this would hurt innovation on the solar and the wind side. Absolutely, yeah. but you know, one of the, as a matter of fact, on that, uh, that specific point, I think both Republican and Democratic administrations have failed the industry in not being able to develop a narrative to say, as a consequence of the fact that we're gonna be moving away from this type of, let's, let's face it, a dirty uh, industry, we're going to launch this program in order to retrain you or whatever it is, move you from here to there, whatever it is for, for 300, however many thousand minors that there might be. All right. Last week, House Speaker Paul Ryan said Obamacare would be the law of the land for the foreseeable future. Well, there are rumblings that health care legislation will be back sooner rather than later. And Governor Kasich is pushing for a bipartisan solution. Kasich in Washington and on national cable news shows has been touting fixes to Obamacare rather than a complete overhaul. Even Senator Sherrod Brown says he and other Democrats would be willing to work with President Trump to find a bipartisan solution to health care. Bob Clegg, you're a betting man. What are the odds of a bipartisan <laughs> solution to health care? I don't think they're very good. <laughs> and, I, you know, even though Governor Kasich and Senator Brown talk uh, about it, but, uh, you know, right now with the atmosphere we're in, uh, something like that's not going to happen very soon. Um, you know, what's interesting about this is politically, for Republicans, it was not good that they couldn't get a bill passed. But for the Democrats, even, I think th it would have been better for them, for the Republicans to have passed something and implemented it. Because I think right now, uh, what the president's trying to do is put it back on the Democrats and say, okay, fine, we'll just keep it as is. And when it all collapses, you people try to figure out what you want to do and then, and then come to me. And I think politically for the Democrats, that's the worst of any of the solutions. And the concern is that the Democrats might uh, suffer further as a consequence of the administration, uh, in effect, uh, torpedoing. Uh, regulations that are supposed to at least keep the Affordable Care Act on track and I, I'm but structurally it was set up in such a way that it's not it gonna last much more than another year or but two. In, in 2018 when this really will become another election issue can Trump really just put all the blame on Democrats 
and not no. Not to, and not I to, think I think what you're seeing already is he's putting blame on the uh, Freedom Caucus. Yeah. To also, I mean, it's almost like he's in the middle fighting both of the ends. And maybe politically, that's that's a smart way to go because he's taking on the liberal Democrats, who, you know. Their base doesn't want them to work with the president on anything. And you saw already with the Supreme Court nomination of uh, Neil Gorsuch that, that even Democrats that talked about maybe thinking about not filibustering were being bombarded with, you know, um, the left you know, saying, well, if you're going to do that, we're going to find somebody to run against you in the primary. So he's fighting, the president's fighting both ends because both sides don't want to really work together. Well, Laura, you can't see Sherrod Brown working with Donald Trump. Really, can um, you? Well, you know, actually, he's he's indicated he he's willing to work with them on trade issues and other uh -huh. places where they see eye to eye. So, but he wouldn't pay for that among liberal Democrats in Ohio. He's he doesn't have a primary opponent, of course, but Sherrod Brown would not. Right, but I, you know, whether he works with them on health care or not, I do think that um, the fact that the Obamacare is kind of on the back burner for now, I think it works well for both the Democrats and the Republicans because uh, had they replaced it. Um, I think a lot of people would have been upset that they were losing their health care, that it was changing. And I think a lot of people during this whole debate over whether or not to repeal or replace, et cetera, a lot more Americans kind of dialed in and started to pay more attention to what is Obamacare, what's on the table, what works better for them. They're a little more educated about what, what's available. Does John, Kasich, I, does John Kasich see a platform where he can take a national leadership role for whatever his plans are in a few years on this issue? Uh, yeah, he's already doing Absolutely. that, right? Yeah. He's already hitting up all the talk shows and talking to as many people as he can to talk about federal health care laws. And I think that he, again, is in a good position uh, where he is to say, I'm the conservative, but I'm the one who can bring people together, even though he doesn't have an official role in, national, in the federal government. Uh, I think Bob's right, though, that I think the Democrats are kind of in a worse position here right now and that President Trump has a little bit of leverage on them because if things do keep going the way they are and things do collapse, you can just blame it on the Democrats and say, well, we wanted to fix the problem. And Trump being in the middle, he can blame either side. I think yeah. that... <laughs> well, he has the ability to no, blame anybody at any point. At any point, <laughs> and even people that don't exist. Blame the weather. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, one way to make a logic out of these negotiations or what is likely to happen is to hey, just think about it as we don't have two parties, we actually have three parties. Three parties. Mm -hmm. Certainly We've got Trump, the, House. the Republicans, and the Democrats. Right. But, but Obama had, Obamacare does have flaws, so... Oh, I, and I thought at one time that maybe they were intentional. I thought at one time the cynical part of me that the, the actual goal was to expand Medicare, to have a single-payer system that would be covered, that would cover everybody. Is there a fear, Bob, that if it does collapse and there is no solution put forward, the, the Republicans could have to deal with a single-payer option? Uh, uh, how would that be implemented? Well, I think <laughs> they, they never well, will. The I Democrats guess. couldn't. Even, when the Democrats controlled, they had 60 seats in the Senate. They controlled the House by handily. They had a Democrat president, and they couldn't get single payer through. But economic forces weren't are weren't were were not at a point then that they could be five, ten years from now where everybody's health insurance premium is doubling because there is no control on the cost and there's no. National plan. Well, I mean, it problem. could. I, I mean, I don't see it in the next five years, but maybe after that. But it's going to have to be a total change in thinking um, because you're going to have the see what Obama, what President Obama did was they he created a system that brought in all these players that would have been against a single payer system like the insurance companies, like the pharmaceuticals. And he let them be part of it. Well, by be, letting them be part of it, it, he created the system that can't exist and won't stay in place because it's it's so poorly structured. Okay. Our next topic, lawmakers at the State House want to put limits on how much narcotic prescription drugs patients can receive. It's the latest move to try to stop the state's opioid crisis. Republican lawmakers propose limiting opioid pain medication prescriptions to three days, seven days, if doctors get special training. Governor Kasich actually put in place new rules that limit opioid pain prescriptions to seven days. This, there were already, there were limits, I think 30 days or 90 days, but this, a week worth of drugs is all you can get now for most cases. Uh, this is for acute pain. Acute this pain. is for, uh, you know, you've uh, broken, you've broken your ankle or you uh, just came out of surgery. Um, this is for acute pain conditions, not for, um, you know, chronic back pain uh, and, 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 and terminal cancer, things like that. Those are, this is just acute pain. 
Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, it, it, what the governor proposed is similar to what the lawmakers proposed. I think they're all kind of heading the, in the same direction. Um, it's a delicate dance, though, between how, you know what what uh, state policymakers should be uh, dictating to to doctors about you know what they can prescribe and, and under what conditions. The doctors are the ones with the training and the patient uh, relationship with the patients, um, and I think there should be a lot of deference to that. But um, that said, um, Amal Soin, he's a pain specialist in um, in the Dayton area. He's uh, the chairman of the state medical board, and he's also on the medical marijuana advisory committee. He said that actually um, that hard and fast rules kind of work better for a lot of physicians than guidelines because you can tell the patient, no, I can't do that because this is the rule. And he also said that the way that the governor, um, the gov governor's uh, plan does allow for um, doctors to move outside those guidelines if they can justify it. Well, what about this? I mean, this is the government getting in the sure. way of a doctor and a patient, something yeah. that conservatives do yep. not like. But it's a, an issue that is just ravaging our state and our country. And I think at some point, when things get so bad, there is a role for government to step in and try to um, help and try to resolve the problem that we have out there. So I have no problems with what the governor or the legislature is thinking about doing. Except you might have an unintended consequence, and that is that the individuals, and this is happening, and I see this, on the criminal justice side uh, uh, frequently that when people can't get a hold of the legal medication then they will turn to heroin and and heroin and related drugs are uh, far too readily available but i think that these guidelines and these laws really tackle when an addict where an addiction starts because anecdotally when you hear about people who where, the, where their addiction starts, it's because they broke a leg or they sprained an oh, ankle yeah. or something and they were just handed a 90-day supply of p powerful painkillers. And I think this can kind of tackle the problem at the beginning end where you can kind of stem the start of that addiction in the first place. So this, this is to limit how, what the patient gets at the beginning and also eliminate any extra pills that are hanging around if the patient stops taking them after a surgery, after a sprained neck. Right, and it also, it limits um, minors, those under 18, to five days worth of um, mm -hmm. medication for, for acute pain. So the idea is to prevent um, that first prescription that might lead, lead them you know, down, the, down the slippery slope. So how, someone who has chronic back pain, who has a long suffered, long back injury from work or whatever, something like that, they're okay on this? Do they have any special hoops to, to jump through? That would be under the chronic pain guidelines. So those are those are different. I'm not. Sh I don't know those off. I think the top it's like 30 head. 30 days or right. Those days. those were scaled back, but not to seven days as this is with the acute pain. And th that was uh, released, I think, last year. Those guidelines. Um, so those are also scaled back, but not not as much as this acute pain. You know, Ohio's made, they've been doing a lot of things on this, like uh, beefing up the um, the uh, subscriber or, or prescriber database and requiring more people to check it before they write prescriptions. Um, that's led to a drop in doctor shopping and, a, and an overall, I think, 20% drop in the number of doses that have been issued each year. Um, there's been you know, guidelines for emergency rooms and urgent cares and guidelines for um, now for this acute level pain. Um, more, you know, a wider uh, distribution of Narcan and Naloxone, uh, which is the drug that you use to reverse an overdose. Um, but but still the the um, you know the numbers are really alarming. Ohio is leading is one of the leading states when it comes to to drug overdoses. So this this helps on the on the front end, but treatment is the other end. The, the Treat, it treatment is the other end. It, That's exactly right, and this has to be looked at as a comprehensive health crisis and health problem. And I think that people, I think I, I'm actually kind of encouraged that over the past two or three years, we have seen the narrative develop in that way, even during the presidential elections. Do, do drug companies, pharmaceutical companies, Bob, do they need to step up more? Do they, should they face more responsibility to sure. help pay for treatment beds and things like that? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, they're the ones that produce these narcotics, so they, they got to take some uh, responsibility. However, right now here in Ohio, the pharmaceutical industry is more concerned about other things that may be uh, put on the ballot this fall. So I'm not sure that they're concentrating on this all that much. Are, are lawmakers reluctant to go after drug companies like they went after big tobacco during the... Well, there are some states that have done that. Um, uh, I think there's been maybe six or seven different states that have filed major lawsuits against pharmaceutical manufacturers for overmarketing uh, painkillers. Uh, Ohio has not joined those lawsuits. All right. 
Our last topic, paid family leave was an issue left unresolved by the 2016 campaign. Hillary Clinton wanted it nationwide. While the government has yet to mandate it, it is showing up at more and more workplaces. Ohio State University offers paid maternity and paternity leave for its employees. Now Columbus City Council wants to offer paid family leave. City workers could get up to four weeks of parental leave or two weeks to take care of a sick family member. The paid leave is 70 percent of regular pay and the workers who have to use would have to use two weeks of vacation or sick time first. Joe, is this the next entitlement? I think if one is one of entitlements that I think a modern society is likely to expect, but it's still rare. Only about 14 percent of private industry employees have the benefit of this kind of a plan, and about 16 percent of governmental employees. In Europe, it is far, far more common, and maybe in other parts of the world as well. But in the United States, I think while we're going in that direction, I think the progress will be typically slow, as it commonly is in the United States for these kinds of progressive uh, ideas. Is it worth it? I, I think it's a great idea, but I don't want the government coming in and telling businesses that they have to provide this. I mean, this obviously comes at a cost, and the cost for the city of Columbus, who's implementing this, is almost a half a million dollars a year. That's fine. I mean, it's taxpayer. It's only taxpayer money. Uh, but, I mean, when we're talking businesses, we got to talk about affordability. Uh, if you're small, can you afford to even have just one individual? go on uh, family leave. Um, I think this is going the way it should go, which is basically um, government entities that, that can agree to do it and give it to their employees, they go ahead and they do it. And then where people in the private sector can do it, they do it and the market forces uh, themselves will determine how widespread this becomes because it could become a very good tool to recruit yeah. people to your company. And I think that's the way the market should work. What is the, what, Laura, what do you think is driving this trend? Is it employees demanding it, competition for good workers, trying to limit turnover rate from folks leaving? Well, I think that there's, you know, probably it's a, it's a recruiting tool to, to um, recruit and maintain and retain good employees. Um, but let's face it, it's also, um, you know, it's a big burden if you don't have paid leave and, and you are going to have a baby and, um, you know, there's, this falls a lot more on women than it does on yep. men, even though there yeah. is paternity leave allowed. Um, but uh, to, to be able to take the time off and, and uh, take care of the baby, take care of yourself, um, you know, get, get breastfeeding going, it, it actually takes some time. And um, I think that, uh, you know, for a lot of workers, um, it's just untenable to, to not, to just miss a paycheck for 10, yeah. 12 weeks. I think the culture of parenting is kind of changing a little bit more too. There's more and more literature out there, more content out there about attachment parenting and making sure you do this, making sure you do that, uh, avoiding in the infant mortality rate. There's just so much stuff out there where parents are, are feeling called to kind of switch up how they go about to do things and take more time off of work to make sure that they can do those things. Could there be pressure as the, as the baby boomers age and need more care from their children, Joe? Could, it, could that be the pressure that you know, uh, an adult worker in his 50s or her 50s or 60s needs two or three weeks to help care for a, a, a really yeah, aging parent. And you know what really makes me uh, wonder, uh, why haven't we been talking about this all along? Because it's really been since the late 60s, early 70s, that we've recognized as a society and in, and in, in industry and in, and in public employment that men are, and women should have equal opportunity to, to all facets of the of the job management and so on and in and in doing so we also have to recognize the fact that the women are the ones to have the babies and uh, provide for that okay. and of course this provides for the dads as well yep let's get to our final off the record parting shots and we will start with you Joe thank you Mike in Columbus the demonstrations continue this Sunday at 2 p.m. the Interfaith Association of Central Ohio will gather behind COSI, uh, uh, Genoa Park, for a March for Peace and Justice. Representatives from mosques, churches, and synagogues will ask the state to extend protections to immigrants and refugees, as well as the safety of the diverse houses of worship. Okay. Bob? Um, I'm involved in a uh, political race right now down in Georgia for a special election for Congressman Tom Price, who's now the Health and Human Service 
uh, Secretary, and this race is going to start getting more and more attention. We have a jungle primary, so everybody's just running. Top two finishers move on to the runoff. Uh, April 18th is the uh, primary, and Democrats are putting a lot of money into it for their candidate. And once we get down to one Republican, you're going to see a lot of money and a lot of national attention. Andy. Republican State Senator Chris Jordan from Delaware introduced a bill this week to allow people to con carry concealed weapons into the state house. Now, this is a place where only a couple years ago there, there were only just troopers walking around guarding the place, and now there's x ray machines and metal detectors. So, to be able to switch that around and to allow people to carry concealed in the state house would be a dramatic shift. Laura. All right, bad news this week for Ohio Public Pensions. Um, you can find all the details at DaytonDailyNews.com. That's my shameless plug. Um, but uh, it looks like State Teachers is going to be looking at uh, cutting the COLA for retirees, and Police and Fire is looking at scaling back their health care plans. Uh, these are really big systems. There's 1.9 million Ohioans uh, that have skin in those, in those uh, programs, and uh, they have like $185 billion in assets. All right. You know, we hear a lot about Ohio State football and basketball, a big name sports, but the Ohio State synchronized swimming team won its 30th, 30th national championship in the last week or so. So congratulations to them. All Who right. knew? 30 <laughs> national championships. Yeah. That is Columbus on the record for this week. Check us out online. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. And you can see past episodes and this one, if you'd like to relive the experience, at our website at wosu.org slash COTR. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.